What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Fudge Mop. This is the Elder Scrolls Podcast. I'm Scott here with Michael and Drew, as always, and today we are talking all about the self-titled cultured people, the Ultima, the High Elves. Have you heard of the High Elves? <laughs> you oh, stole yeah, well, it. I was going <laughs> to say that. Ah. <laughs> The boys from Somerset Isle, you know, they they claim to be the closest descendants of the original Aldma, basically meaning they're the closest descendants of the gods. And uh, we're going to see if they've got a leg to stand on when it comes to that. Mm. I mean, in terms of their superiority, they kind of do have a leg to stand on in terms of just raw biology, at least. Like, if you're going to pick a race to be in the Elder Scrolls universe, you can't go too wrong picking a race that can live for hundreds of years with you know, magical prowess, um, and, and, and actually even as well. And if you even, uh, jump onto things too, like just the advantage that gives you, like there's, it's said that like, you know, artists, a high off artists are the best because they've like had a thousand years to refine their craft Mm. and like stuff like that. The other thing too, though, and I don't know how much this stacks up with current canon or like gameplay mechanics versus whatnot but in like Morrowind for example they also had um it's 75 percent resistance to common disease for example because they're just that much better you know what I mean they also did have weakness to magicka weakness mm. to fire frost and shock I mean, as spe- well speaking but- of which we should, I, w- I really want to bring that back like the high elves to me seem a lot more interesting when they have like weaknesses basically to all magic um more so fire mm. and just base magicka than to shock and frost um, and then obviously they can resist disease though and have way more just base magicka to use like the apprentice um, apprentice stone right yeah yeah for, like for, for those of you guys who don't know we are very pro racial diversity and giving each race really distinct abilities that really make it stand out so you know an Argonian feels like playing an Argonian which, you know, it's, it, play, it doesn't just feel like playing a Breton with scales. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, it's funny because in Daggerfall, they had like a... Their special advantage, it was called, was an immunity to paralysis, which which mm. is kind of interesting. And I know it then it just got watered down afterwards in, in Oblivion and Skyrim. Um, although Oblivion was still pretty, pretty solid. Yeah, like a, yeah. Go. Oh, I was just gonna say, like Oblivion still had some, some, uh, some cool effects, like they had um, yeah. disease resistance, enhanced magicka, weakness to magicka. Yeah. Well, um, we'll bring it back to the Ultima themselves first, and I think like with most cultures, you can kind of look at the origins of their like religion or faith and see how that bleeds into their culture, and then how that sort of formulates who they are today. But it seems as though the Oldma way back in the day, their traditional story would have it that, they, you know, Aldmeris was lost and then they found the Somerset Isles. And so the Ultima on the Somerset Isles. But at first they seemed to uh, worship, sort of ancestor worship, like everyone sort of did. But there was this sort of early, somewhat of a schism between... Um, between certain groups and factions of Ultima, Ultima uh, or Ultima, it's kind of especially not, with an um, Australian what they are at that time. It's hard to hear, but we've got Oldma with a D and Ultima yeah. with a T. The T being the highest. Yeah. Elves. And um, basically, though, what happened was there was sort of it started to become a popular idea to start only revering the you know the socially better or more deserving ancestors and this has ended ended up formulating what they revere as the Aedra and you get sort of like you know that's why there's Finaster and Xarxes and Auriel like these are these great ancestors that are revered but no longer just your dad who was a farmer or whatnot which is kind of a little bit different to sort of like the uh, old ways that the Sigic Order have which is some complex system of ancestor worship and then you also have like later the Velothi who really really like their sort of family ancestor worship it's not just about like oh the greatest the Aedra and then obviously you throw in the Daedra stuff too and the Velothi left and went to Resdane but um, you can sort of see how that kind of um, stratification of society into certain castes and there's like these ancestors are worthy and these ancestors are not how it sort of of worship um, sort of formulates their modern day sort of caste system where they have really strong social you know class divides 
and between ability and so it's on. like the essential distinction between elven and human in that when when they're talking about ancestor worship it's not very different from the way humans would just say worshiping the gods because you know it, it, for, to a high elf worshiping your ancestors as you're talking about with the adra it's just worshiping the gods you know but but as far as they're concerned they're trying to maintain whatever makes them as close to these ancestor gods as possible as opposed to looking at them as something distinct from themselves they're just an earlier more powerful version of themselves yeah well that's like they're like that's a general uh, heuristically you can kind of say that you know men generally generally believe they're created by gods whereas elves believe they're descended from mm -hmm. gods so and and the ultimate very strongly. It is so. a bit funny though, isn't it, that they just pick the most powerful ones and then they go, these are our ancestors, but then kind of brush away all their other ancestors who would be less powerful and less interesting, but you know just the same mm. their ancestors. So it's like curating a pantheon of your your favorite kind of characters or <laughs> entities, and then yeah. saying, oh that's our pantheon and all of them are my ancestors and not bringing up the other ones. It's just like okay. Mm. And their sort of uh, obsession with um, like kind of maintaining, like you're just saying, Drew, the the purity of, like the closest, basically maintaining the uh, closeness to the gods or their ancestors in terms of both like cult, like their sort of superior culture. They're trying to maintain their culture, but also in bloodlines, which has led to uh, eugenic practices and stuff, where they're very specific about like not you know, crossbreeding with lower castes and stuff like that to sort of maintain the purity of kings descended from gods and, and so it's on. Also, so. It's like their willingness to, to follow a god depends on that god's opinions on Auriel's idea that um, that they, w they were trapped in this mortal realm. So any god who kind of goes against that is then becomes kind of shunned by the high elves. So... Um, I think uh, Stendhal is a good example of that, right? He's the uh, the apologist to men, so long as I'm not mixing up my gods. But yeah. anyone who's um, kind of pro the human ideas of, you know, th this is our, we are mortals. We're not something more grand than this. We are thankful for our lives as opposed to being angry about this trap that Oriel talks about. Then those gods are, are enemies as far as they're concerned. Hmm. Which yeah. is why Shaw, yeah. you know, Lorcan is the ultimate enemy because he created this trap. Yeah. Th yeah, this this may feel a little bit off topic, but it is funny to think just how important genetics would be to them in the sense of the raw advantage that it gives them. Like, because we can assume that some would have an even bigger natural affinity for magic than others, right? And as we know, magic can help you live a really long time. So if you kind of breed with the right person, your child may live. 500 years versus 250 years right and if you keep having mm. the those with the highest magical prowess come together then you will just end up having the most powerful families as well because you live for longer so you have more time to grow wealth and practice different things and become more intelligent man they would have a massive divide of inequality mm. <laughs> if you think about mm. it it's like pretty well, that... op because it's not just based on nothing and i'm not saying they pick their partners based purely on um, magical prowess but you can see how that would play an impact somewhere yeah well that that's um a really interesting thing because most people would assume you know you go like oh being a high elf that'd be mad because you all of the personal things but if you are oh, all of the biological factors but if you were a high elf in somerset isles it's like yeah it might be all right if you're a king or, or whatnot or a higher nobility but like anyone else in the social strata like you you can't like it it seems as though it's really hard to move up and down between the different classes and because you're very restricted and you're just the society is very like hands-on like okay you're born like this okay this is what you've got to do in life kind of thing except for the sort of you know privileged few so you can kind of imagine it would be quite appealing to many high elves who are say i'm a lowly merchant or or just just like you know a farmer or something to actually get out of there and fl flee to say the empire even with more cosmopolitan ideals but you know say a, a lowly high elf to just you know a, a village of people in um you know Leowen, near Leowen or something would respect them as like uh, well they might be you know racist or something but like if not might respect their magical mm. prowess or look up to them it's, almost, it's kind of know, like um it's all based on relativity i guess it kind of reminds me of hmm. like nowadays 
where people from um, countries with stronger currencies can move to a country that has a weaker one, like let's say someone from the US moving to Thailand and suddenly with what would be an average income in their country, uh, they're like a king in terms of what they can buy, what they can afford. Mm. It's not like, it's kind yeah. of like that. If you think about it, you would move somewhere safe in the Somerset Isles, you're a very average mage. And then suddenly, oh, you're a good mm. mage here. And you've been living for longer than everyone else. So people see you as really wise. And, and But that's not to say yeah, all yeah. high elves live a really long time. I mean, obviously we know that's not the case just based on the dialogue. You would, <laughs> you would encounter more high elves referencing like different time periods um if it was super yeah. super common to live for you know six or seven hundred years it's weird because elves kind of are like it, the best way to describe that there's some eso things that are kind of like oh you know average going two to three hundred years and all that kind of stuff but with elves as a general rule it seems to be kind of like magical in influence or sometimes it's just variability like sometimes you find a high elf at 200 and they look like they're about 90 for a human or something and you see another elf at 200 and they're like young mm. you know they're like in their 20s you know what i mean it, it's um it seems kind of variable but um I guess we can also sort of start talking about, like, obviously we kind of get the gist of, of what a high elf is. And we've talked about the Thalmor and stuff before, which is like a very radicalized version of their like core principles anyway, of, you know, elven superiority and um, descendants from gods, yada, yada. But um, Somerset, uh, Somerset Isles and the Ultima have actually, you know, at times they've gone in plenty of exodus. So you've got the Aelids and so on, which sort of came from there as well. And you've got the velocity that came from there. But um, the Ultimary language sort of ended up being one of the sort of defining, I, I guess, bases for the modern Tamrielic language um, as well. And I can't remember, I'll have, to, I'll have to find it, whether it was Riemann or not. But there was a point where all legal documents and stuff were done in the sort of uh, Ultimary language. And then they were changed um, into Cyrodiilic by I forget who it was. I can't remember if it was the Septim Empire or Riemann. But regardless, it's 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 kind of like you can kind of imagine it like the Latin of our real world in the way that it was very important for all religious documents and legal documents for a long, long time because of the Roman Empire and so on. They just sort of got in early. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it's one thing that's yeah. you know that I there's a risk of making everything more confusing by bringing this point up, but when we when we talk about the the kind of the differences between the old Mary Dominion and the Empire. Um, when we consider that a lot of history is recorded by the Empire and, you know, after this point it's recorded in Cyrodiilic, it it asks the question, like, how much of um, Somerset and high elf culture and society is as crazy as an ex crazy and extreme as we see it and how much is potentially played up by the Empire wanting to kind of, like, mm. distinguish themselves as the cosmopolitan ones as opposed to the, like, you know, there's the, the idea that they, they only keep one out of ten children if they're racially pure enough. And it's like, well, and then other people argue that that's just absolutely not the case. But that, I think that's in one of the pocket guides. It says they do that. So mm. it, it becomes a bit interesting because I like the idea that Somerset is as alien as it, it's described because it just makes them much more interesting. But you you got to wonder, like, it, a lot of the times it is from the perspective of the culture who writes the history, which from our yeah. perspective, in pretty much any time you play the games, it's very empire focused and a lot of yeah scholarly work comes from an imperial perspective yeah absolutely and especially since the the ultimate themselves are you know quite isolationist like all throughout history they've generally kept somerset isles for high elves and by them you know to themselves um and so you can imagine they're very much the same with their sort of knowledge and documents and so on. They're not exactly like flooding that out to, to the empire. So it's why the empire mm -hmm. like, um, you know, becomes the, the dominant uh, scholarly, you know, mm -hmm. stuff that, you know, the, the books and stuff. are. All I suppose, I suppose it could be just a story about one group of high elves then applied to all of them in the pocket guide. You know, mm -hmm. like it sounds like something the nobility would do. But, like, a lower class might mm. not. Well, that's the thing. Like, some of these emissaries, especially in, like, the first pocket guide, they, they go in, like, they, they already really dislike the High Elves before they even go and visit yeah. um, Alanor. And um, I, I think that's one area where the High Elves have kind of been 
screwed out of some really, really interesting law is that when, you know, using the Dunmer and Morrowind as an example, before Morrowind was shown in ESO, you know, in, in ESO it's an interesting place, but it's not you know, it's not crazy alien and interesting the way we actually see it. But that's because Morrowind had a fully-fledged game and a fully-fledged culture and all of this stuff fleshed out. Whereas the High Elves didn't get that before their portrayal in, in ESO. You know, which is one thing that kind yeah. of makes them much more basic, you know, the elves that you see in most fantasy um, worlds as opposed to the kind of, you know, we bring it up a lot because it's really interesting to imagine they're like the city of Alanor made from glass and insect wings with like hy hypnotic swirling ramparts and impossibly tall towers and all of that so it's like to imagine a game that actually explores that would make the High Elves as interesting potentially as the Dunma yeah, but we've never really got sure. that yeah I, it's, it's funny like in terms of gameplay it would be one of those really hard just because of you know how they're all like isolationists and they don't like other races but there's even this cool like little um excerpt it's actually from the eso interactive map of tamriel but it says um like this is just about some of the obscene like not obscene um, but crazy kind of customs and stuff they have but like as a guest you will not be required to memorize uh memorize every detail of proper behavior at a high elven dinner table and surely you won't be judged too harshly for minor misunderstandings however the more you know the better your impression you make yada yada but this is what you have to do so you refill the glass of your of the diner to your left when it is low and never refill your own glass never rest utensils on the edge of any vessel do not eat more than the most prestigious attendee at any function allow the head of your table to lead the discussion never watch another while they chew using the wrong utensil is considered barbaric if you do not know, do not know which to use watch other guests and follow their example but you can see like just that little bite sized thing of just how like rigid and mm. formal like it seems very controlling on every single element of conduct throughout the day whether you're just eating or whether you're probably it's like probably even applies to other things like reading or how how crossing you the road stack boxes or yeah it kind of it sounds really sucky to be honest like there's not it seems like freedom is not a thing that's highly prized there and they have a very uh, like um it almost makes you think a little bit of like sort of ancient india and stuff in terms of like the higher like the caste system in the way but mm -hmm. like you've got to your your life is destined before you're sort of even born and so on you know what i mean like your place in society yeah because i guess uh, you know if the vast majority of high elves are not part of this extremely high caste who are like you know in the image of the gods you can imagine that a lot of the you could say the vast majority of high elves maybe wouldn't buy into this idea that we need to be perfectly pure and just like our ancestors because they're just like you know they get the they get the short end of the stick for not being considered as close to their ancestors which can be arbitrary really yeah I, you know it can yeah. be decided by who's in charge i guess it all kind of drives home the point of just how xenophobic and snobbish they can seem to the other races of tamriel because you can imagine just how snobbish they would be to their own kind based on a caste mm. system so if they think that you know if the highest of the high elves think that some of the lower class are nothing or like you know worthless to them what are they going to think of an argonian or a khajiit when they travel to other provinces there is no way yeah. that I could imagine being confident in forming a pact like the Old Miri Dominion with the High Elves, let alone the Thalmor, um, knowing that they look down on their own kind as well. Mm. It's interesting um, to actually note another thing about their spread um, is how you have the House Dereni or, or whatnot, the Dereni Elves basically, and they went to High Rock and they basically ended up enslaving the Bretons and informing sort of like they sort of create this caste system again but it's interesting how if you think about it at its root breton's caste culture and, and like you know stratified classes and all that is heavily um influenced by the dereni elves bringing that from somerset mm -hmm. isles and and that over as well i also just wanted to clarify real quick i mentioned before like ultima language being the basis it's kind of it is in in part two but also remember um the Ultima language, when it goes to, it becomes sort of uh, transforms into Aeladun and Cyrodiil, and the Aelids were there because the Aelids played a big role in the the ones that allied with Elysia. Um, they sort of helped the men kind of, you know, create their new little empire basically. Um, until like you know, like a hundred or something years later, the elves started getting kicked out of power and having their lands taken from them. But hmm. yeah, 
Well, so there's a lot of influence in the modern and serial dealer. Talking about the Dureni, the Dureni is kind of like the perfect small scale example of how high elven culture can really come back to bite you in the ass because they create this culture where they're at the very top of the chain and the, the Bretons that they, you know, they can use as concubines and they're only allowed to marry each other. They're not allowed to marry you. You, you know, they're essentially property. Um, and then when you're so selective about who you can breed with and then you're you're an expanding culture at the same time, um, you just end up becoming completely outnumbered by everyone who's not this high race like you mm. to the point where you just dwindle away and you can't control your lands and the, the race you essentially created of, of man mer will just end up naturally, not through conquest, just taking all your land and you just end up with the, the few pure people left on a tiny little island in the middle of the Iliac Bay. So it's like, you know, it's mm. it's not always the best strategy. Mm. I mean, you can see why they try and ally with the Bosma who have or the most populous race of elves um, and the Khajiit as well help bolster the numbers as well. <clears throat> yeah, is, you can imagine. Oh, go on. So I, I was going to say it is interesting just quickly. I found um their hierarchy so it says at the top of the wise okay teachers and priests followed by artists princes warriors landowners merchants and workers below workers were the beasts such as the enslaved goblins who the old may used to perform the jobs beneath the dignity of the very least of them so it is interesting that um education but also art seems to rank quite highly like above mm, you know yeah. merchants and other things yeah it it, I kind of see that f for them, art and architecture are like really closely entwined because, you know, it's like when, when you know, when we talked about the description of Eleanor, um, it, it sounds like not everything about their, their architecture, at least as it's described, is entirely practical. It's almost like a display to the gods of how great they are and, how, you know, reaching towards the heavens, even though there's probably not much need to create everything from glass and you know mm. things like that it's it's yeah. like it's an artistic endeavor just as much as it is um practical interesting thing to point out there too about that caste system too with enslaved beasts at the bottom but often when people think slavery they think of um dunma but slavery really is an elven practice like in the way that you you know the ultimate did it and they did it with the goblins and so on you've got then they go to cyrodiil and then they enslave the humans yeah. there then they go off to resdane and then they enslave the um argonians down south like even the dwarves enslaved the, the, uh, the snow elves kind of creating the foma yeah exactly yeah. Elves are, you know, they really, it's a common theme of them sort of that we're superior and we can enslave these other people. Like it's a very, uh, it's an early elven ideal, I would say. Yeah, there's no doubt that the old Mary Dominion, you know, on the surface level can seem like this, this pact, uh, this diverse pact of Khajiit, Bosma and High Elves. But, you know, you mentioned the goblins before. I am. I imagine beneath the surface, especially in the Falmor, they're they're looking at their Bosma and Khajiit allies as they're basically our goblins who are going <laughs> to be working on the mainland for us. And that's why a lot of the times, you know, where other alliances can be formed fairly naturally, they resort to kind of tricking the other, the tricking the Khajiit, especially into aligning with them as if they're their great saviors, like on the the Void Knights, supposedly bringing back the moons. Mm. yeah yeah i get i always get i i mean i always got the vibe with the two there's two pieces of information when you you, you know you hear about how there's the the cullings and stuff in valenwood so this is all the fourth era stuff about the thalmor culling like you know dissidents and so on within within valenwood um and then also when remember when there's the khajiit assassin gets sent after you in riften or you've just come out of the suez yet esben and there's a khajiit oh, assassin yeah. in yeah. a dress or like from thalmor but like i can really imagine them just really treating them like tools mm. it's like here you, you know i'm going to use you as a tool because you know a high elf sticks out as well you know you can go like oh you know, a khajiit and then the nord might look oh they're just a criminal khajiit kind of thing or you know whatever but they're actually a secret they, they do have two of assassin. the most nimble uh races who would be the most useful mm. for being assassins and thieves and spies and stuff mm. and then they don't well obviously warriors are very useful but they don't really need a, a warrior centric race because they have a lot of offensive capabilities in their own way with magic and um, other things and obviously nimble fighters are still effective fighters too in the case of the Bosma and the Khajiit 
Yeah. Or little Conor McGregor's. Yeah. <laughs> like. I mean, it's, it's true though. And like, especially if they're armed yeah. with bows and stuff and, you know. Yeah, well, when we were talking about the Bosma, it's like there is a, you, you could argue there's wasted potential there in that for the most part, they keep to themselves and they, they're they pacifistic, but they can also be very violent in terms of just how their culture is set up. So if, if you can indoctrinate some Bosma and, you know, the same applies for Khajiit, if you can indoctrinate them into your way of thinking for the from a high elf perspective, you've got, you know, an, an untapped army of incredibly good warriors like archers and assassins and and all of that so it, it benefits them massively to to kind of like become friends with these yeah the other thing races. to consider as well is it kind of fills the gap that magic doesn't so if you think about pure warrior or strength or kind of tank capabilities in in a war or a battle um the thalmor do have magic and as much as they're not the biggest fans of um like necromancy and stuff you you can imagine daedra i mean we know about lord narafin and all that jazz which you know it's not not yeah. not my most favorite thing but i guess it's still canon but um you could have mages summoning things as well the um interesting thing too the other big benefit of just having valen wood and elsewhere in general is actually like some of the sort of like just territory and control, and if you think about it, that um, the Ultima are a, have a they have the, supposedly the strongest navy. They have a really powerful navy, and you know a history of fighting the Sea Elves and and slowed and such. Um, and also they're an island nation, so a navy is somewhat essential. But in regards to the modern um, like political landscape, you can see kind of why they might have wanted to go for Hammerfell and especially get that sort of locked down that southern Hammerfell um, area as well. And, you know, they've already got Valenwood because um, that gives them a good control of the, um, it's the Abakian Sea, I think, or Abyssian Sea, I don't know how you pronounce it. But um, because you've, you've got Anvil, which is a major port for the Empire and so on. And if you can kind of like, you know, got Valenwood to Somerset block in it here. And then there's like, you know, if you had Southern Hammerfell and Somerset, you can kind of get a really good control of those seas without, you know, limiting trade. Because I suppose, like, if you think about the Imperials and where they are, they can either trade from Leowen and go the long ass way all around Black Marsh, Morrowind, up into Skyrim, into High Rock. Or they can do the much shorter route, which is just out of Anvil, up into High Rock, into the Iliac Bay, which is a massive trade hub. Like, if you as the um, Ultima or the Thalmor really, um, you know, if you manage to lock down Hammerfell and you have Valen with that, you've cut off their trade, like, because inland trade between, you know, over all of the mountains over across Skyrim or in through Dragonstar or stuff, it's a much rougher, um, slower process. So um, there's probably more more to mm. their Hammerfell conquest than you think, because yeah. you can at first just go, oh, why'd they want to conquer a desert? Yeah. But it's like, there's more to Hammerfell than just that. And Black Marsh isn't that. something that really needs to be conquered too. So it's not like they don't have a grip on the mm. bottom right hand of the continent. It's more like that doesn't really exist um, until the Argonians mm. cause a problem. And Morrowind's been, you know, had a lot of chaos with Red Mountain and whatnot. So, you know, they kind of yeah. have a lot of useful territory if they, if they did keep Hammerfell. Yeah, tactically, mm. they have the ultimate advantage. It's like, you know, to kind of, you can compare it in a way to Britain and Germany in, in World War II. You know, it's like Britain is, is really hard to penetrate because it's a, you know, you have to cross the channel in order to attack it. And then not only that, but Germany, you know, they had to operate from taken land in order to launch an assault on, um, I'm getting my examples mixed up, but you know, in, they had to conquer France in order to, to attack Britain pretty much. And you can imagine that if the, if the empire wanted to push to Somerset, it, it's kind of hard to go from Anvil if you've got enemies in Valenwood and all that. So it's like, you, you can see why... Short of having the Numidium on your side, you really can't mess with Somerset. It's like that's the only way to force their hand is to have a, a literal god working with you. Yeah. Absolutely. They're pretty powerful. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's also why I think, like, obviously we've talked about this before, but Feldal Scroll 6, like, Hammerfell is the best setting for any sort of reignited Thalmor tension mm. and and stuff like that plus like i think a setting there too in hammerfell is really cool because you'll actually be able to experience some of the battlefields and and see some of the damage that the great war did because skyrim wasn't really the theater for the, for the great war at all it was pretty much cyrodiil and hammerfell so if you um it, it'd be cool do you know what i mean and, and some of the wounds would be fresh i mean still 25 years but you know you can do a lot of just you know some destruction takes a long time to repair and it's not like you have machines 
but I guess I guess magic. it also depends yeah. on if you want to repair it as well like it depends on the priorities too obviously they have yeah. the capabilities to repair everything in like a couple of years if they want to but it's like is it feasible is it worth doing now or should they do something else yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to say, sorry. Ultima yeah. are quite a straightforward race. I was just thinking back to when we did our podcast on our top 10 favorite races uh, based on kind of coolness, for lack of a better word, mm. or how much we liked their lore. And the Ultima ended up surprisingly on the lower end of my list, even though before I started, I thought they would end up higher. Because I, it's it's yeah. funny. There's a massive distinction between races that I love the lore of and races that I love to play. Like for example, High Elf is a race that I love to play, and I played as my second character in Skyrim. Um, was a High Elf who had. It sounds really funny, but I, I thought it was really cool at the time. It was like full muscle um, High Elf wearing like the topless fur. So like, but then using yeah. lightning magic. So you can imagine a real like you know how the Force One mages have this like arcane bandit feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of like that. I think I even yeah, remember that was on the that Xbox yeah. 360. <laughs> An interesting thing about uh, just Thalmor to talk about too is there's so in the Pocket Guide to the Empire Third Edition, which is so it's written in the Third Era around the time of Oblivion. Um, you have uh, it does say this. It's like with the insularity of the Somerset of the Somerset decisively broken many Ultima particularly the young which among the high elves is a fairly loose term began to take a more critical view of the rigid hierarchy of Ultima society and its strict cultural xenophobia while there had always been discontent on the fringes of Ultima society which was traditionally resolved by exile of the malcontents for the first time a significant element of Ultima began to agitate for social change um this nascent revolution of the Somerset Isle has taken many forms. Most constructive, surely, is the acceptance of new cultures and races onto its shores. Yada, yada, yada. It goes on for a bit, but um, it's interesting. So this would have been at the time, like, you know, end of third era, early fourth era, that there was kind of this more like, yeah, let's move away from sort of, I guess, superiority and rigid hierarchy and so on. But that gets completely flipped on its head with the Thalmor up uprising and then when the Thalmor take control. Um, and I guess that also explains the the night of uh, is it green fires where they tr where you had some early dissidents trying to escape to Hammerfell from mm -hmm. this new regime starting off in Somerset. Yeah, as well. But it's just interesting, like you know, you got to treat them as individuals. Like not even high elves, not all high elves, most certainly um, do not benefit from you know the strict caste systems and. Of, um, you, you might find as well, and stuff. I mean, you see it, not every high elf you meet in Skyrim, for example, is particularly snobby. I mean, a lot of them are, but plenty of them aren't. You can imagine that it's kind of like the orcs, where you have the orcs in the stronghold, and then the ones that leave get called the city orcs, and they're kind of frowned upon, but they're not about that stronghold lifestyle, right? Whereas mm. the high elves who leave as well, you can imagine, I just want to go be a merchant in High Rock, and that's it, and... Where they are, their job might not be respected, but you would find mm. that a lot of the ones that stay are the ones that like it, um, and the ones that don't like it would leave. Because it, it's quite easy yeah. to leave, it seems. It's not like, especially as a high elf, like there's plenty of places and you, have you can options, go. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like mages, we especially in peak empire times with the mages guild and so on. Like there's you, you know what I mean. Like I mean provided you're a mage but even so going to the imperial city and just like i feel like it, it is a kind of a cooler you know like i would want to probably live in the imperial city or some kind of cosmopolitan nation because you know inherently how like even the imperial city and this is how it tends to be in real life that cities are more cosmopolitan and accepting in general versus like rural areas or more like you know you'd have a better chance in in this than say bruma or coral or something like these sort of more like clovian sort of isolated groups they might have different but what if you were going to be the king or like high class in somerset isles <laughs> you'd I think say so. it, it it sounds cool but you can look at a lot of noble families like yeah. unless you and really love boring, it if you kind, kind of, of wanted any freedom yeah because it kind of sucks because your your life is so restricted into how into what you can say and do and who you have to marry and what you have to you know it might be far more liberating to go and Go to the Imperial City, marry someone you love and yeah. do some, you know what I mean? Whatever you like. Well, yeah, because a lot of their, their lives are built around 
trying to reclaim something that they really can't do you know like th this yeah. obsession with what they once were uh, they, they're going to be constantly undermined and foiled by the 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 reality that they're not like that anymore you know and i think uh, like building on what you said about how you thought they were going to be a, a more loved race but then you kind of put them lower down the list is that well, one thing about um, the Ultima is that it's like you've got all of these really fascinating groups that diverge from them who are really interesting because they kind of came from that. Whereas the Ultima are just like the ones who stayed behind, who refused to change at all, which is is kind of what makes them, you could say, could potentially makes them a bit more boring than the other elves. But at the same time, yeah. what makes them the most fa fascinating is the, this idea that they just have no idea of their true origins. They're like, we can't even find our old homeland. <laughs> it's like, it's a bit <laughs> tragic, really, as much as they paint themselves as the very best. And like we've said many times, like High Elves, with some of their descriptions in the books and so on, with all the beautiful crystal towers, they had the potential to be far more alien. But as we've seen them in ESO and, and so on, they are pretty close to just sort of your classic Lord of the Rings type elf. So they kind of by default, it's like, oh, I've been there, done that. We've seen it in D&D &D and every iteration of fantasy I felt for the like last it was 70, Shrek 80 years. When I, <laughs> it, it felt what? like something out of Shrek. Like, you know... The city from the oh second my. film? Uh, something like that. Yeah, right. like the swamp. Such an obscure... <laughs> no, but it did. It just made me think of back the Orcs episode where you're like, they're practically yeah. Shrek. Yeah, it's it's like, yeah. It just seems like this. Shrek like, is love, Shrek yeah. is life. Um... You, yeah, there's an ancient meme for you. Here's, here's an extra. You, you know that thing where I showed you um, where there was like uh, the, those animated videos and it's got like Shrek as kind of like a Shrek Geralt kind oh, of picture. Oh, yeah, and he's that's like so good. Riding a hot dog. I, I just saw some meme and it was like, and it was like, what the, oh, imagine what the internet will be in 30 years. <laughs> and it's like Shrek riding a hot dog with a Witcher thing and there's like Obama and all this kind of stuff. It's so... So spacey. Uh, so absurdist but yeah yeah i can imagine as well being an ultima too when we were talking about being like in the higher class and it being boring in the elder scrolls universe magic is real and i just can't imagine that the pull to politics and wealth would be nearly as interesting i know it's all relative and when you get there you mm. might be like uh, magic but i'd much rather be sleeping in some bunk bed in a mages guild you know eating basic food and nobody knows who i am but I'm learning to, I don't know, summon literal, like, demons. <laughs> but monsters or, like, yeah. you know, cast spells and turn invisible. That that sounds much more appealing to me. It's kind of like that thing of, like, getting superpowers would just make you not really care about some of the more mortal, boring trappings Mundane of life. Things. Yeah, yeah I, I think yeah. part of what makes the high elves more fascinating for me is buying into these like massive conspiracy theories you know it's like um like for example my i, I don't really play it so but the character i created i created a high elf but i made his his skin as tan as possible because the idea is basically oh he's one of the aliens who escaped alicia's rebellion and it's, it's like you know they, uh. they it said that a lot of them traveled to towards valenwood and somerset to kind of mesh in with the foul like you know the early times of the foul more and and they're secretly just trying to get revenge against men so it's, you know it's not just some expansion it's like it's like no we want revenge for something that happened thousands of years ago and it's like <laughs> you know it's kind of like you almost have to 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 really enjoy the high elves you kind of just give them credit for everything that came from them which is like obviously so much but you know the dureni and the aliens being like fascinating examples of their expansion that didn't get too crazy following completely different cultures and gods. Makes me think too, actually, why some of the Aelids, it's never mentioned really, but Aelids, some of them could have got along with the Kaima and so on and have converted to the sort of Velothi way of life mm. um, in an exodus as well. But, um, yeah. I mean, maybe some yeah, did, you can... you, you'd never, you'd never know. Yeah, well, if they Never turn know. to Daedra worship, it's not going to be a big leap for them to follow the good Daedra. There's probably some shrines and temples to I guess those Daedra it, in Aelid cities. I guess we don't have much information on the Aelids, but like, I still imagine that the Aelids, because a lot of the... It seems a lot of the benefits of worshipping the Daedra wasn't, oh, I love you so much. It's more so all of the powers and stuff that they could achieve from them. So I would say that the Aelids are probably still quite like a mm -hmm. in their beliefs in the way that Lorcan like trapped them here kind of thing. So it would have been quite a, I guess that's why, because of the shift, even going to, um, 
uh, to the Dunmo, well, to the Kaima at the time, their belief about Lorcan mm. and, and, and the purpose of Mandus is very different. So they're like fundamentals. Yeah, are different. it's like the Daedra yeah, was case. more like their hedonism and their fun, not their... Re- yeah, not and if, their these, yeah. if these Daedric princes are encouraging them to enslave and torture humans as well, it's like that can totally align with the high, <laughs> a high elven attitude despite kind of, yeah, worshipping a Daedra. Yeah, that yeah. is true. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think that's... Like, I mean, without mentioning every single little detail or little, you know, thing that they do do, but... Um, do do. Mate, <laughs> 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 hey, we're going to get demonetized now. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think that's about it. Do you guys have anything else to mention on the Ultima? I, the the Sidic are their own beast. Yes, you know exactly. So it's like yeah, that was my thought almost entirely. Like Sidic Order gets a podcast kind of vibe. And I think if we kind of jump into the gods too much, you're kind of a lot of like discussing the elven gods. You kind of want to bring up the Nordic gods, and I feel like we'll probably have some kind of Dawn era episode yeah, at one that'd point. Be, that'd be good. And where we'll discuss the goings on, so it just helps separate yeah. these things. No, so. I like that. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in to the Elder Scrolls podcast. We will see you next week. Adios.